the single infinite universe, what we usually what we used to call the entire universe, right, uh, is a finite age. And that really is one of the most consequential ideas of science in the 20th century, that the universe had a beginning. Welcome to Closer to Truth. I'm speaking with Professor Will Kinney about his sweeping new book, An Infinity of Worlds, Cosmic Inflation and the Beginning of the Universe. The book offers a clear and comprehensive understanding of core ideas in cosmology. We love that on Closer to Truth, you know, especially cosmic inflation. I liked it a lot. I learned some too. Will, welcome. Congrats on the book, An Infinity of Worlds, a great read. Thanks very much, Robert. Okay, look, let's start with uh, what's been in the news lately. And, you know, at Closer to Truth, we get a lot of uh, comments from our audiences around the world. And people have been writing to me, and they've been saying that the, some of the findings of the James Webb Space Telescope, um, particularly the size of galaxies and the, the very early time right after the Big Bang, black holes there, challenges the standard model of cosmology. And some people even claim it it falsifies cosmic inflation. What's your reaction? I, it's the, the new web results are, are really stunning. And so to, what, to summarize what they are is basically galaxies are forming a lot earlier than we expected. They're seeing big, well-formed galaxies really early in the universe. This is something that challenges the standard picture of cosmology called lambda cold dark matter, right? So okay. structure formation is driven by cold dark matter in this model. And, uh, the galaxies are forming earlier than we're expected. That doesn't, that challenges the ideas of structure formation that we have based on cold dark matter. It doesn't challenge at all the idea of the Big Bang itself. And in fact, it doesn't really have any relevance at all for cosmic inflation per se. Have you heard um, some of these arguments? Uh, I have, and some of them are wrong. I mean, <laughs> well, the question is whether all of them are wrong. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, so that, we, uh, we understand the universe pretty well, but uh, we don't really understand what dark matter is. Hmm. And really structure formation, the formation of these galaxies is governed by the physics of dark matter. This is way, way, way later. So this is, this is still uh, millions of years after the, uh, uh, after, after the Big Bang. Inflation happens incredibly early. Sure. Uh, right. And so these are these are basically unrelated issues. Right. So the Big Bang as an idea is fine. Cosmic inflation is still fine. We might have to fine tune a little bit the physics of dark matter in order to understand this. Or it may just be that our the computer simulations that we use to simulate galaxies have a bias in them that we weren't we weren't aware of yet. How about it's early, still being worked out. But how about early black holes? That that's an interesting question. I mean, I'm not a real expert on that, but it looks like the favored model for the formation of these supermassive black holes. These are millions to billions or even tens of billions of solar mass black holes right, at the right. centers of every galaxy. Those happen. Those form so early and so quickly that nobody really understands where they come from. Yeah, the they may, maybe gas, is gas, gaseous condensations as opposed to, to star, the typical way we, we develop it. Through, through right. The, 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 the leading model right now is called the direct collapse model, which is actually dark matter itself just directly yeah. collapses into these supermassive black holes very early. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of mysteries associated with that. It's still real terra incognita. Okay, well, we're going to get into a lot of the detail, which I'm, I'm really excited to do. But let me first give a brief bio, because that's sort of a formality. Tell people who you are. Professor Will Kinney is in the Department of Physics at the University of Buffalo at SUNY. Uh, his research focuses on the physics of the very early universe, which we'll be discussing, including inflationary cosmology, the cosmic microwave background, dark matter and dark energy, all of our favorite subjects. He received the SUNY Chancellor's Award for Excellence in Teaching in 2014. All right, well, let's start by focusing on your book. And I'm going to start really right at the top uh, with your title. Um, and the driving word of your title is infinity. So what do you mean by infinity and how does it apply to cosmology? The title is uh, a quote from the Renaissance scientist and philosopher Giordano Bruno. Uh, so Bruno, I can uh, I can read the exact quote that uh, uh, led to the uh, the title of the book. So Bruno wrote talking about so Giordano Bruno was a died in the wool Copernican, and in fact paid with his life partly because of his advocacy for Copernican ideas. 
And he was even more Copernican than Copernicus. He was the first person to really take Copernicus's idea that we're not special, that the earth is not special and, and really take it to its logical conclusion. And Bruno wrote, God is infinite. So his universe must be too. He's glorified not in one, but in countless suns, not in a single earth, a single world, but in a thousand thousand, I say in an infinity of worlds. Hmm. So Bruno took this Copernican idea of the, uh, the ordinariness of the earth and realized that what it meant was that there were other solar systems, other planets, possibly other civilizations. In inflation, in the subject of this book, Inflation predicts not only are there an infinity of worlds in the Copernican or the sense that Bruno meant it, but actually an infinity of other universes. That inflation necessarily, at the end of the day, if you, if you take the theory to its conclusion, uh, implies that, in fact, our universe is just one of many that are continuously being created out of this uh, eternally inflating background. Right. And so th there's a real parallel here between Bruno's Copernican ideas and the ideas of eternal inflation that are more Now, modern. we're going to get into this in more detail when we, we do later, but I just want to get a flavor for this term because we're using it, but there's some very uh, important specificity here because infinity in one sense is uh, within this bubble universe. You, you use a, a glass of beer with the bubbles in the beer in the, in, in the, uh, in the book, which, which is uh, very evocative. Uh, but the bubble universes, which uh, uh, Alan Guth, Andre Lindy are, are, are famous for, uh, e within the context of a bubble universe, which is this tiny one bubble amongst these, these zillions of bubbles, uh, there's infinite space within that one bubble. Uh, yes. When, look, when looked at from the inside, but not from the outside. So it's it's like something out of Harry Potter, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so that, that's a different way. So if you're inside it, you think it's infinite. If you're outside it, you know it's not. So that, yes. that, that's two different ways of thinking about infinity. So we, you'll, we'll be talking about it, but I just want to put that out. Let's be sure we answer that question. So now there's a second question about infinity, because you talked about cosmic inflation and uh, the, the infinite number of worlds that it creates. But um, what is that infinity? Because uh, we know inflation has to start. So to be a real infinity, it has to have always been there because if it's, it's started and then it's going on to any number, that would be, you know, name any number of universes you want and what's happening is more than that. So, so that's, that's one kind of definition. The other is that there's, it's literally a countable infinity, but I don't think you can have that if it started at some point. Well, this is one of the other big questions, right, is did the universe itself have a beginning. And there are a lot of different ways to answer that question. Right, and we'll uh, get into that. And uh, it, our universe, our little bubble among many, absolutely did, and we know how old it is. It's 13.8 billion years old. We've measured that really accurately. The uncertainty in that is only about 200 million years. Yeah, that's great. Um, um, yeah. Um, but then uh, this is embedded in this larger structure, and whether that larger structure is past infinite or not is a much more subtle question. There are uh, the, the basic answer there is even in this larger structure that contains many, many universes, it, uh, there are mathematical theorems that indicate that that almost certainly itself had a, had a beginning. Now, let's just pose that as, as, as the two possibilities. I, I think that's pretty right. much universally exhaustive. Either it did or it didn't have a beginning yeah. that, <laughs> that, that uh, the, the, the entire multiverse. But wouldn't that change your definition of, of what in the, the nature of the infinity you're talking about. Sure. Uh, and so in this picture, the universe, even the multiverse, has a finite age. That can be, in principle, be enormous. I mean, there can be vast gulfs of time sure, before sure, our sure, universe sure. came into being. Sure, sure. But uh, it is, uh, continues infinitely into the future. Right. So this is a picture of a universe that is past finite, but future infinite. Right. And, and so therefore, the number of universes on a static basis at any given time, right now, we had to come up with the number of universes, it, it, it would be a finite number. But, you know, if, now it would be much, much more just as a, 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 one of our one second later, so it, it could be a trillion more universe. Who knows? That might even be a small number. They're continuously being created. That's correct. Right. Okay. Well, well, we'll get into this detail. All right. Now I want to go back, and uh, we started with your title. Now I want to go to the first sentence of your book, which is very clear and simple. The universe had a beginning. Uh, okay. 
And now what I want to do is parse that very carefully, just like we might do for Genesis 1.1. No, that's a joke. This is, this is not Genesis. So how are you defining universe? Is it all that we can see in the observable universe in our particular light cone, uh, given the finite speed of light, we can only see a certain amount of, of, of time in the past, or is it everything that exists? Because there's a huge difference. Yeah, and that's one of the things that I do in the book is I start with that sentence and then I gradually develop the idea and, and make the statement more, uh, more precise, right? And so the universe we live in, which is, as far as we know, spatially infinite, although we can't, can't say one way or another because we can only see a tiny little patch of it called our observable universe or, or our horizon, we know that our universe is much bigger than what we can see, at least that. And uh, the mathematical models we use are of an infinite space. So that universe, the one universe that we live in, that did have a beginning. Okay. That is now, inflation places that as part of a larger structure, and then we begin to ask the questions whether that larger structure had a beginning. But we know for, for uh, to a very high degree of certainty scientifically that uh, the the single infinite universe, what we, us what we used to call the entire universe, right, uh, is a finite age. And that really is one of the most consequential ideas of science in the 20th century, that the universe had a beginning. And it completely changes our picture of our place in the world, I think. Uh, and I, I think it's an underappreciated uh, realization that came out of science <laughs> Uh, in the early 20th century and then was developed later on. It, it's really uh, profound. It's, it's one of the most, uh, you know, I, I've said it's the single most profound thing that human beings have, have discovered, which, which started with the Hubble discovering the, there are other galaxies that are real galaxies, not just uh, uh, supporting nebula to our galaxy, real galaxies, and that and the universe is expanding, and, and that putting together with Einstein's uh, uh, um, uh, field equations uh, and the cosmological constant made us realize that there is a beginning. It's a startling uh, concept. Yeah, and it's, it's something that people have thought about all the way back to Aristotle, right? So Aristotle believed that every cause, uh, every, every motion must have a cause, and that cause must itself have had a cause mm -hmm. and so on. And if you take that chain of cause and effect back far enough, there must have been some first mover, some original cause of the universe if it's not past infinite. Right. And later on, Thomas Aquinas adopted that uh, idea into uh, his theology, essentially, as proof of the existence of God, right? So this became something that was really closely, these Aristotelian <laughs> ideas became closely inclined, uh, entwined with Roman Catholic mm -hmm. theology. Mm -hmm. uh, and now we have a different picture of what we mean by the beginning of the universe, but it still raises some of the same philosophical questions that Aristotle realized. Yeah, and makes them more profound because we now it's no now it's based on scientific fact. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just review with us the cosmological principles so we, we have a good starting point for our discussion of the book. The cosmological principle is a modern extension of the Copernican principle. And really, if you think about it, they're the same thing. So Copernicus... Right set the earth free, right? He, in, 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 the, in, in the old Ptolemaic version of the universe, the earth was special. It was a singular point. Everything was focused on the earth. We were at the center of the universe and what Aquinas called God-ordained and man-centered, right? So we humans have a special position in the universe. Copernicus set the earth into motion in, 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 in the solar system. He, he realized that the earth was in some sense ordinary. The cosmological principle which is the really the underlying organi organizational principle that uh, we build our cosmological models on, is that not only is the Earth not special, but there is no special place. And mathematically, we, we uh, state that as the universe is homogeneous, that's the, that is, it's the same in every spot, at least on average, and isotropic, which means that it's the same in every direction. This by, it immediately means that the universe can have no center, and no edge. There's no boundary to the universe. And this constrains very strongly the kind of uh, how the space of the universe can be constructed. So we basically borrow Copernicus's idea and extend it much in the same way that Giordano Bruno took Copernicus's ideas and extended them as well. And that's the idea of the cosmological principle is that there is no special point in the universe. 
All right, Will, let's get into the real meat of the book, Cosmic Inflation. It's the main topic, and it is a, a terrific exposition th throughout. And normally, we just hear the term and a little bit of definition, but you really go through it and give uh, excellent understanding. And I want to do that today. So let's start very simple to define cosmic inflation. Inflation, in short, is a theory of what happened before the Big Bang. Now, when you say the word Big Bang, you can mean one of several things. One of them is that the early universe started out very hot and dense and then expanded and cooled. Another one is that it came from an initial singularity, a point where our laws of physics break down because everything went to infinite density. And by Big Bang, in this sense, I mean the hot, dense, early state of the universe. So in a standard cosmological model, that starts out of a singularity. In inflation, we replace that singularity with an earlier epoch. Mm -hmm. And unlike the early, the hot, dense early universe of the Big Bang, where there was this primordial soup of fundamental particles at very high density, all moving very fast, in, in inflation, the universe is empty. It consists of nothing but empty space. The temperature is at absolute zero, and it is expanding exponentially quickly, extremely rapid expansion. This is what we mean by inflation. And that ends in that model in the, in the classic Big Bang. Exactly. At the end of that, inflation is driven by the energy of empty space. And that energy of, of empty space that drives inflation decays into all the particles of the standard model, heats the universe up, and creates the hot Big Bang at the end of the inflationary epoch. Okay. It's a, um, as uh, uh, Alan Guth says, and as you uh, reproduce, a spectacular re realization. Uh, as he was riding his bike uh, in Berkeley or someplace, uh, and ca came to that. Um, uh, but, and, and it's, you know, a fantastical idea that could be a negative or positive term, but the, the issue is what problems does it solve? Because what problems did we have prior to inflation that seemed to have no solution that inflation solves? Uh, list each of the problems. Well, ironically, when Alan came up with the idea, the problem that he had in mind was magnetic monopoles. Yes. So a magnetic monopole is a north pole of a magnet without a south pole attached or vice versa. And some theories that were popular at the time in the mid-1980s predicted copious production of magnetic monopoles in the early universe. We don't see them. He had to get rid of them, so he used this expansion to do it. Ironically, that's one of the least important things though, about inflation as we understand it now. Inflation solves big questions about the universe that aren't explained by the standard Big Bang model, which is why is the universe so big? Why is it so old? Why is the geometry of the universe so close to exactly flat or Euclidean? These things are, uh, and, and why is it so homogeneous, right? Why is the universe the same in every point? These things in the standard Big Bang model, there is no dynamical explanation for them. You just have to sort of assume them as a boundary condition. You assume that God set the universe up in this very particular way in order to create a universe that looks, looks like ours. And it's highly fine-tuned. These things are unstable. If the universe deviates from flat geometry a tiny little bit in the early universe, then it becomes very curved today. Or the typical lifetime you would expect if you plug numbers, relevant numbers in, you would expect the universe would only last for about 10 to the minus 30th seconds or so. And here we are 13 billion years later. Why? Inflation creates a single unified dynamical explanation for all these sort of big properties of the universe and explains them all very neatly. Yeah, so um, let, let, let's delve into that, the flatness and, and the required precision of that flatness uh, in terms of, of, of parts, because I think you said uh, uh, something to the effect that um, any deviation, I want to define that quantitatively, in the either direction, if it, if it had more of a positive curvature, the universe would collapse in much less than a second. And if it had a negative, and so it would just be a giant black hole, and if it had a negative uh, uh, curvature, it would expand into empty space and there could never be any structure at all. That's right. We'd have just an empty universe. Right. right. So, um, so what is that tolerance level uh, at, at that time and what is the equivalent today? I think you said something like one, in a tr one part in a trillion? Today, the universe is measured to be geometrically flat to about the level of a tenth of a percent, which is an amazing tour de force that we can measure that. Right. Right. Um, what does that imply about the early universe? And so that that same parameter of the curvature that's equal to one is is exactly flat to within about a tenth of a percent would have had to have been flat to within about one in a trillion mm -hmm. when the universe was about 60,000 years okay. old. 
Yeah, oh, 60,000 years. And, and, and that, yeah. that that's a coincidence that, you know, seems uh, is non-coincidental and, and, and that has to be explained somehow. That's the idea. Yes. OK. OK. So those are the problems and inflation uh, deals with each one of those. So why, why don't you just explain uh, for each of those problems quickly how inflation solves it? So start with flatness. Well, it turns out that when the expansion of the universe is speeding up instead of slowing down. For most of the history of our universe, the expansion has been decelerating. Because for a very simple reason, matter. everything in the universe pulls on everything else with gravity, so it tends to slow the expansion down. Right. Very recently, it started accelerating again, but we'll skip, on, skip that particular detail for right. now. Right. But it turns out, and as long as the expansion is slowing down, curvature gets amplified. Right? So if there's a little bit of curvature, it becomes more strongly curved. If the expansion of the universe is speeding up, if you start with curvature, it flattens it out. And you, one way to think of it is if you have a, 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 big, a, like a big balloon and you inflate it and you only look at a little tiny patch of that balloon, that that little tiny region looks flatter and flatter the bigger the balloon gets. It's the same reason when we stand on the surface of the Earth, the, the ground looks flat, just because the Earth is so much right. bigger than our horizon, how far out we can see. In inflation, it's very much the same thing. It takes a very tiny patch of the universe and stretches it out to enormous scales. And so the little patch of it we can see looks flatter and flatter and flatter. I think one of the most important things to understand about inflation, how this works to, to make what you, you say actually happen, is the uh, um, um, what happens in the doubling times. And of course, we're dealing with uh, the durations from our perspective of 10 to the what, minus 36, the minus 39th to some some incredibly that's a trillion trillion trillionth that's 10 to the minus 36 a trillion trillion trillionth of a second yeah uh, is astonishing but you have this one of a little short statement where it's it you say it only takes 202 doublings two which is a doubling to the 202nd power so just 202 mm -hmm. doublings of size to go from the plank length which is 10 to the minus 35 meters to the entire observable universe. And Geometric growth, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. We love that in finance. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, this is a heck of a good interest rate. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 that's the that's what the claim is in inflation, right? I mean In fact, it probably went on for many, many more doublings than that. And I'm I'm sure we'll get to that. Yeah. That's the minimum number you need to explain what we oh, see in our, okay. in our observable good. universe. Very good, very good, very right. good. Because yeah, okay, yeah, so but that that's an incredible, uh, incredible number. Look, I I have to tell you a, a, a closer to truth story that's one of my favorite. We've been doing this twenty five years, and this is one of my favorite stories. So when I first heard about this, I was I, I couldn't appreciate it. It seemed, seemed ridiculous that all this happened from ten to the minus thirty six to the minus thirty nine second. I mean that just seems inconceivable that that this makes sense. So we, and uh, with uh, uh, Closer Truth um, uh, producer director uh, uh, Peter Getzels and I, we were in Iceland in 2007 for a conference. It's the first, uh, second time we had met Alan, and they had a little event in addition to all the uh, the, the, the science, and that was a snowmobile experience in Iceland. And as as luck would have it, Alan, I was paired with Alan. I was the rider. And he was the driver of a slow <laughs> of a snowmobile. Now, Alan has never been in the snow driving snowmobiles before. Certainly, I haven't. So we have these two, you know, New Yorkers on a snowmobile, and I was terrified when Alan was driving. So one second was like an eternity. And so I told Alan afterwards, one second with him on the snowmobile made 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 me appreciate that 10 to the minus 36 is at least understandable on, on a on a different relative scale so <laughs> that was literally our first experience uh, uh with this so um and so what when you look at uh the the these the, this time of 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 doubling uh, what, what is the current best thinking uh, in terms of 10 to the minus 36 to the 39th? I mean, what's the time and how many doublings is the order of magnitude people estimate or do they do that? Well, I mean, we don't know for sure. We only have um, basically, so it, the, uh, how many doubling times you need depends on sort of the energy scale at which inflation happens. 
And we only have an upper bound on that, right? So the, uh, the doubling time, uh, so the, the, the higher the energy, the shorter the doubling time. So that 10 to the minus 39 seconds, for example, is sort of an upper bound. Okay. It could be many orders of magnitude lower. And we don't really know what, the, uh, what exactly, we don't know that energy density, so we don't really know very well what that doubling time was. We know it was very, very brief on any sort of uh, uh, you know, uh, normal time scale. But it could vary by many orders of magnitude, depending on what the energy density of inflation itself is, and we don't know that. Right. And what would that that imply at that point about the the size of the observable universe to the size of at least our bubble? Uh, is, is there any relative sense that we can get? Well, I mean, in, in these models, the interior of our bubble universe it's is infinite. infinite. Yeah, and, and the size of our observable universe within that infinite space is just determined by the age of the universe, right? So we can only see out as far as light has had time to travel since the Big Bang. The details of inflation don't change that much. Uh, so the, the sort of uh, what became our observable universe today during inflation would have been about the size of a grapefruit. Right, I remember, yeah. Give or take. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and that has expanded out to something that's the size of our entire universe. So in, uh, in, in uh, a trillionth of a trillionth of a second, something the size of a grapefruit expanded out to be the size of our universe. Yeah. Today. I think you missed the trillion. It's a trillion, trillion, trillion. Trillion, trillion, <laughs> trillion, yes. Yeah. 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 Well, a trillion here, a trillion there. So, you know, after a while, you're dealing with real time here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, okay, so um, d during that... Um, during that period where from a grapefruit to the observable universe within is that right the yeah. grapefruit grows okay um all right what did, what did briefly some of the data because we now talked about the definition we've talked about the um problems it solves it seems to be very well but what what is the data that supports this so that we go from metaphysics to uh uh, precision cosmology and, and, and real science. So the idea that inflation solves these big problems of cosmology, flatness and homogeneity and stuff, that's impressive, but it's not really testable, right? You're just like describing uh, gross properties of the universe. You want something that is more detailed. And luckily, inflation gives you that for free. And then inflation, when you write down these theories of this rapidly expanding universe, what you find is that quantum processes actually create, not only smooth the universe out and make it geometrically flat, they leave behind little ripples in space time, little ripples in the density of the space. And these ripples are observable. These are the things that form structure later in the universe. So inflation gives you for free the initial seeds of structure formation. And we can see those initial seeds in the light that's left over from the Big Bang called the cosmic microwave background which about 380,000 years after the Big Bang, the universe cooled to the point where atoms, neutral atoms formed. And that released all of the heat, the light that was present in that hot gas in the early universe was released in the form of, of light, which would have been in the visible wavelengths at the time. And that light gradually cooled and it's now in the microwaves. And we have studied this in exquisite detail. It was discovered by Penzias and Wilson in 1965. And most recently, the European Space Agency's Planck satellite made exquisitely precise measurements, not just of the temperature of this leftover radiation, but in the little fluctuations in it called the, uh, the cosmic microwave background anisotropy. Those little fluctuations were laid down during inflation and have existed essentially unchanged since then. And we can use those fluctuations to test the physics of inflation. And this is one of the most powerful pieces of evidence that we're on the right track with this, is that those fluctuate, inflation predicts a very specific form for how those fluctuations ought to look, and they're bang on what they should be, uh, observationally. And these are the quantum fluctuations that occur in empty space, that so-called virtual particles coming in and out of existence almost instantaneously. But because of the inflation, That's right. inflation process going on, it... it it disturbs them getting back together. And, and so those, those particles become sort of, they're reified and become real things. That's exactly right. It's, it's a process that's very similar to Hawking radiation from yeah. black holes. So black holes evaporate. There's the cartoon picture where you have virtual particles that pop out of the vacuum. One of them falls into the horizon, the other one escapes. This is how black holes evaporate. 
In inflation, the space is expanding so fast that virtual particles pop out of the vacuum and they can't recombine and annihilate again. They get swept out of each other's observable universes. Yeah. And this process of virtual particle production, all exactly the same physics as Hawking radiation, is responsible for creating the initial density perturbations that formed all of the structure in the universe. It's a remarkably beautiful picture. Yeah, it, it, it really is. So initially, the, the uh, cosmic microwave background uh, was um, very homogeneous, and but these uh, the 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 the, uh, the 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 points that are different are what one in a hundred thousand or about one part in a hundred thousand. That's right. So. And that's it looks so like slightly denser. When you first think about it, you think that, well, that's like that's noise in the background and maybe it's wrong data. But that data, that, that is really the most significant parts to, to, to explain the whole picture. That's right. So the way it works is that regions that are a little denser than their surroundings are a little warmer and regions that are less dense are a little cooler. And those changes in temperature of about one part in 100,000 are related to ch changes in the density of the gas at about one part in 100,000. And those are the initial conditions for all of the galaxies and stars and planets and people and everything else in the universe came from those. Because once you have even the slightest difference, gravity will work its magic over time because it has as much time as it needs uh, exactly. to gradually exactly. form e around each of those clumps more and more and more. That's correct. It's, it's, it's really, really astonishing. All right. So, so historically, uh, in the initial phases, inflation was proposed that people got very excited about it. But then there was the problem and so-called old inflation. So briefly explain the transition from the old inflation to the new inflation. And this goes back to the what, early 1980s or middle -80s. early 80s. Yeah, very. It was when it, when when Alan first proposed his model, even in the if you read the original paper, he realized that it didn't work. And the reason it didn't work was it created little bubbles that don't run into each other. And the, and the, and the way that he uh, wanted to end inflation, to have the, the inflation end and the universe heat back mm. up again, was to have all these bubbles run into each other, uh, or called percolation. And all those bubbles running into each other would have created all this heat and particles and would have, would have, pot, would have started the hot Big Bang. That was the original idea. Doesn't, doesn't work because the bubbles don't run into each other. The universe in between the bubbles is expanding so quickly that they never hit each other and they just get stretched apart. This idea became repurposed in eternal inflation, which we'll talk about later. But so then it was quickly realized this didn't work and even Alan knew it didn't work and he wrote in his paper that it didn't work. But very rapidly, uh, Andre Linde and uh, Paul Steinhardt and, and Andreas Albrecht independently came up with this idea of what's called new inflation where instead of being trapped in a little cup that keeps this, this field in one place, you have something that's rolling slowly down a hill. And this, is, this new inflation or slow roll inflation solved those problems because you didn't have to have separate bubbles percolating. You ended inflation and reheated the universe by a completely different mechanism. And this is sort of now what we just call inflation now. We don't even bother <laughs> to distinguish it as normal. Yeah, yeah. Uh, incredible. So now when you make this step to solve the old inflation problem, to enable uh, our universe to emerge, you then create a new problem or a new vision because now that process is, um, even though in our universe it coalesces and stops, that same process creates more and more universes. So describe the process normally attributed to Andre Lindy in terms of um, uh, eternal inflation, chaotic, uh, eternal chaotic inflation, how that process works and what are the implications? So this quantum zero point energy that gives you the fluctuations, gives you structure in the universe, right? That same process causes you another problem, which is that if, the, if, you're, if you're rolling slowly enough, the quantum jitter in, uh, in, the, in the fields that you're using overwhelms the classical evolution, right? You become dominated by quantum mechanics. And in this limit, what happens is essentially you're rolling, inflation is a ball rolling down a hill. Quantum processes make the ball roll back up the hill again. And if they're big enough, you can just keep rolling up and up the hill. And there are regions of the universe that keep inflating. So the, the inflation, the ball will roll down the hill and end in one spot. That creates a little bubble that turns into a hot big bang. 
but in a vastly larger space, the bubble is still rolling down the hill. And you, so basically the, the, you end up inflating forever and creating more and more and more of these bubble universes as inflation ends locally. But those bubbles never run into each other. This is what was the problem with old inflation. And so in this modern picture of eternal inflation, each one of those bubbles is a separate infinite universe like our own. They're all being pulled apart exponentially because most of the space time is still inflating. And this is the beer bubble analogy. So it's like bubbles in a glass of beer where each bubble that, uh, that nucleates contains an infinite universe, but the beer, the liquid in between them is still expanding exponentially. And that process goes on forever. And this was very quickly realized by Andre Linde uh, that this would take place and he called it eternal inflation. Is there any way today uh, where you can put a, a boundary to the number of uh, universes of being created every whatever period of time, every second. Is it, I mean, we, we say a huge number and it's infinite, but is there any way you can put a boundary on that number? No, <laughs> we got no idea. In order, to, in order to do that, you would have to have an understanding of the initial conditions for inflation, and we don't have any idea yeah. what those could have been. By the way, I loved your that. quote from uh, Alan Turing. Uh, about uh, the difference between science and religion? That what yeah, so Turing wrote in a, in a letter to a friend that uh, um, science is a differential equation and religion is a boundary condition. Yeah, that, that is really smart. Uh, that is, that, that's a wonderful <laughs> point. I mean, that, that, that totally answers the question I, I had. I mean, it, it, and religion we're using in the most, the broadest general sense. It could be metaphysics yeah. or something like that, not, not what we standardly think of religion. Uh, that's a w wonderful way of saying it's exactly right. So what you're saying is the answer to my question is no, because we have no idea of what the initial conditions were. That's correct. I'm going to push this a little bit further and then I'll stop. So is it possible to get a um, uh, simulate what different boundary conditions would be or initial initial uh, conditions? Uh, and then for each of those simulations, determine how many uh, what the implications of each would be with a numerical number. Is that even possible in principle? Yeah, people are just starting to do this using numerical relativity codes. These are computer programs that were originally developed to study things like mergers of black holes, but they can be repurposed and applied to understanding things like the initial conditions for inflation. So there are groups out there now that are just beginning the hard work of uh, simulating, basically taking these numerical relativity codes and simulating very simple toy models of the initial conditions for inflation. Hmm. And uh, results from that are really very pre preliminary right now, uh, but there, people are just starting to work on this, uh, and it's very exciting. Okay, when there's some results, you've got to come back and tell us what they are. Will do. <laughs> well, I have to tell you another story, and, and this was is a more serious one in terms of my understanding of the whole concept of inflation. So when I was first learning this, when Closer to Truth first started, it was in the late 1990s, so 25 years ago or so, a little bit less, um, I saw, I went through Andre's work. I, my, my science is neuroscience, not physics, so I couldn't understand all the mathematics, but I got some of the things. But I saw this number in terms of the size of what the universe, the totality of, of the multiverse, I don't know if it was called multiverse at that time, but these bubble universes could be, and it was 10 to the 10 millionth power. That's 10 million zeros after a one. That's not 10, 10 million, but the power of 10 million. And I was frustrated and I kept reading the paper because there were no units. It didn't say meters, it didn't say, you know, parsec, it, it, there were no, no units. And I couldn't find the units. And so when I met Andre, before we, 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 we did our interview, I said, I'm really bothered that I read this and there are no units. And then he, I said, it could be, Planck length units, or it could be size of the universe. And Andre's comment was, it doesn't matter because the difference between a Planck length and the size of the universe is 10 to the 180 to 185. And so one, 10 to the 185 is not even a zillionth of a rounding error of 10 to the 10 million. Absolutely. And that was the, the, the fundamental realization for me of what a, a, a spectacular way of thinking this is all about. Absolutely. And in fact, this 
gets to a, a real sort of a fundamental issue with a lot of these, uh, with inflation in particular, is this idea of what's called the measure problem, yeah. in that the numbers are so large, in fact, once they tend to infinity, that it's not even possible to define what you mean by a probability across, uh, over sets that are this large. And so it's not possible to make statistical arguments, for example, about fine-tuning of fundamental constants. You know, why is the strength of electromagnetism just so, so that atoms are stable and life can exist? People have tried to explain this using things called anthropic arguments, using statistical arguments to, uh, uh, to explain this fine-tuning. But in the inflationary multiverse, the numbers are so large, these infinite sets, that you can't even define what you mean by a probability. And this is a fundamental mathematical problem that a lot of theorists are still struggling with. Hmm. Uh, does this also relate to uh, Boltzmann's brains? Uh, the, the, right. The, spon so, so the spontaneous the, eruption of, you know, my cognitive thinking for this second is just a, 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 a spontaneous event that will just disappear within a fraction of a second. That's right. The idea is that it is vastly more probable <laughs> to that you are an isolated brain that is only imagining the universe that, spo that spontaneously formed out of nothing. It's more probable for that to be true than it is for the universe to exist, at least in a lot of these models. And right. of course, no one really believes this, but this is a reductio ad absurdium. It, it's right, just showing right. you that these probabilistic calculations have a fundamental flaw in them, right? Mm. Uh, and we don't know how to resolve that fundamental flaw. Okay, let's discuss the um, the multiverse and the uh, the product of inflation and and what that the the multiverse is because it, it seems to be uh, and you talk about in the book very well the geodesically past is incomplete this uh, thing that Alan Guth and I think uh, uh, Alex Valenkin worked on another another person that showed that no matter where, where you, no matter what model you do, you still have to have some kind of initial singularity or something initial in the beginning that you, you can't remove. Is that right? That's right. And this, is, this has really become my new research obsession. Uh, ah. And my last couple of papers have been about this question. So when you want to ask the question, did the universe have a beginning? Right? We've already talked about the simple answer, which is our universe came from a Big Bang. We know that. We know how old it is. But whether this larger multiverse structure had a beginning is much more subtle. And you, you really have to define what you mean by having a beginning. And the way that we mathematically define this is each of us, as we go through space and time, we traverse a path in space and time, like a thread. Right. So we move. We always move forward through time. We move back and forth through space. So your life from where you begin, where, where you're born to where you die is a line in space and time that you traverse. And that line is that thread of your life is called a world line. And or it's called a geodesic is a more mathematical term. So the mathematical way we ask whether the universe had a beginning or not is an idea called geodesic completeness, which is a universe can only be said to be infinite into the past if every possible thread through space-time goes on forever. If any of them have ends, if any of them have edges that get cut off at some finite past time, that's referred to as geodesic incompleteness, and that's the sense in which we mean the universe had a beginning, that there are paths through space and time that end at something that is not part of that space and time. It could be a singularity. It could be some extension to the space time. It could be some initial condition that is quantum gravitational in nature. We don't really know. But when you look at inflationary spaces in particular, uh, Alan Guth and Alexander Vilenkin and Arvind Borde in a very uh, uh, famous paper in 2002 showed that basically every inflationary space time that you could imagine had threads world lines through that space-time that ended at a finite past time. The inflationary space-times are geodesically incomplete, and they showed a very general mathematical proof that there was, this was true in any inflationary space-time. And that means that inflation had to have some sort of initial condition. You can't t get rid of the initial singularity. That was the original hope that inflation would let you remove that singularity from the Big Bang altogether. Right. That hope was dashed by the borde guth and Vilenkin theorem, and you can, you can push that initial singularity arbitrarily far back in time, but you can't get rid of it. And so some inflation had to come from something else. And we have essentially no idea what that something else was. 
Right. Th- that's a really important uh, point uh, that uh, um, I've not followed the mathematics, but if that's mathematically prov- proven, that's extremely significant, obviously. Yeah, and one thing that uh, a paper that uh, myself and my graduate student Nina Stein put out about a year ago was looking at alternatives to inflation with these bouncing universes that uh, uh, scientists like Paul Steinhardt and Anna Ayas have proposed, where the idea is that the universe goes through cycles. We were able to show that one of their proposals for a cyclic universe has to be geodesically incomplete for exactly the same reason that inflation is. That oh, you can't yeah. get rid of it by the bouncing models either. Huh. Well, that must have made them unhappy. I probably did, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we didn't hear from them, so. <laughs> Let's, uh, let's talk about the anthropic principle, which is a very sensitive one and divides a lot of physicists uh, into different camps uh, in terms of using that as a way of, of uh, working with the, the, the multiverse uh, to explain the fine tuning problem. It just says it's the selector effect that we wouldn't we, we couldn't be making this observation unless we existed. It sounds like a circular argument, but it's actually not. It's very probative. Um, but you pose uh, three objections to the anthropic principle. Uh, let's let's go through the first one that it's not science. Yeah, I mean, it's it's essentially uh, my first objection is that it's it's not really a scientific statement at all. The the idea that the universe, uh, all of these things are these these fundamental constants of the universe are tuned just so to allow our existence uh, because we're here. Right. In its weakest form, it is a circular argument. And in its strongest form, I think it's an anti-scientific one. It's simply punting the question and saying that there is no answer to this. We don't know why the strength of electromagnetism is what it is. In fact, there's no explanation and we, we, we should stop looking for one. Yeah, that's why many people don't like it. But, you know, a, a lot of good guys on the other side, uh, Steven Weinberg, Lenny Susskind, Weinberg famously was a big proponent of the anthropic principle. Yeah, and this, I, I, I am I am a huge Weinberg fan, and this is one place where I, you know, regretfully must disagree with my idol. You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, the second objection is that the anthropic principle has no recipe for determining what things should be varied, uh, selected anthropically, and what things shouldn't. And the, the the way I put this, and this is some this is something that I've done for fun for many years, is when I am I, I, I'm talking to string theory colleagues, for example, at conferences. I ask them the question: If you could imagine the strength of electromagnetism varying from one universe to another, could you imagine the laws of mathematics varying from one universe? Great to question. Another? Great question. And inevitably, they say no, absolutely not. They they retreat into a very platonic uh, hmm. uh, viewpoint, which is that the laws of mathematics are universal; they're fixed. And these other things aren't. Well, what determines the difference? Yeah. And where's the boundary? Yeah. And nobody can answer that question, right? That's you right. know, and that to me is deeply unsatisfying. Yeah. And the third, ex- the, the third exception is that in order for anthropic selection to be selective, in order for it to actually pick out particular values of constants, it involves very, very particular assumptions of what you mean by life. And very narrow ones. And in, 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 in the book, I call this carbon exceptionalism, right? You know, so that it's only if you assume that life has to be something like us, that the anthropic principle actually has any power to select any particular choice of physical constants at all. But it, you could imagine, for example, life existing in a universe with no atoms, no stars, nothing, just gravity, as long as, as, long as there was sufficient complexity to allow uh, complex computation, for example. So it... The, the anthropic principle simultaneously depends on uh, uh, universes being I- incredibly numerous, but also that life being incredibly rare. And we don't know that either one of those things is necessarily true, especially the rarity of life. And ultimately, the, the anthropic principle is a repudiation of the Copernican principle. And this was realized uh, in the original proposals for the the anthropic principle, that it's an anti-Copernican idea, that if the anthropic principle is to work, we must in some way be special creatures. There must be something special about us in the universe. And that's exactly the opposite of a Copernican viewpoint, which is that we're not special in any way. And my book is a manifesto on Copernicanism, if you like. I, 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 you know, this is, it's, it's a, it's a call to, for, uh, to take, to follow Bruno and to take a really radically Copernican perspective on the universe. Yeah, I, I'm, I, I could spend a half hour debating you on that uh, because it's not clear to me that the anthropic principle, uh, it, it, you know, can, 
can be uh, uh, attacked as non Copernican, even though on its surface it is. Uh, I mean, it, it may be the only thing we've got to give an explanation. I mean, uh, the burden of proof would be on you and, and your colleagues in that camp. David Gross, for example, told us on Closer to Truth, I hate it. I mean, he was, <laughs> <laughs> you know, was it. I'm I, with him. I said, I said, what do you think of the Anthropic Prince? He said, I hate it. <laughs> uh, so... <laughs> Well, um, hating it and thinking it is wrong are two different things. Yeah, that's, true. That's, true. that's good. That's a very good point. I should have said that. <laughs> I think everyone hates it, but some people think it's necessary. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's a, that's, a, that's a great distinction. Uh, your second category, no uh, prescription for deciding the properties, brings up a, a fascinating discussion in the book, which I, I think was really one of, one of its highlights to me, which was uh, that some people equate the concept of a multiverse and generating our universe that we're aware of with Darwinism and sort of a, a universal Darwinism that um, in, in terms of an analogy with natural selection, because it, it contains randomness. I don't want to get into the, the biology of it, but the, it's more complicated, but, but random generation of mutations, and then a selection effect from that. Uh, is is a crucial ingredient that that you say that the anthropic principle lacks. So compare the way it's been used, uh, the concept of universal Darwinism and real Darwinism, and what and what your analysis of that is. Right. Well, this idea of cosmic Darwinism, is, as far as I'm aware, dates to uh, uh, was really the first person to dive into it in any detail was Lee Smolin, uh, who came up with a model in which you were creating black holes and then those black holes are spawning new universes. And he uh, created a selection effect out of the populations of these, these black holes being created, these universes being created in the interiors of black holes. In the inflationary multiverse, however, there is no selection effect, right? So, so Darwinian evolution depends on two things. It depends on uh, reproduction, right? So things that reproduce uh, will reproduce. Things that reproduce more efficiently are going to outnumber things that reproduce less efficiently. But the third, the secret sauce that makes Darwinian evolution work is finite resources, right? So if you have this process of reproduction taking place in an in 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 environment with finite resources, then selection selects out fitter populations because the, the, the less fit ones die out. In the inflationary multiverse, there's no sense of a finite resource. It just continues re reproducing indefinitely. And so that there's no selection principle that winnows you down to particular choices that are more uh, uh, evolutionarily favored. And so you can't, because of that missing ingredient, you can't really apply, you can't really make that analogy directly between eternal inflation and, and Darwinian selection or anthropic selection and Darwinian selection. I, I just don't think it works. And the concept that you have a test of fitness, in, in which we know what that is, is reproductive right. success. And so exactly. that, that's a, a fitness test. So you don't you don't have a fitness test. Uh, that's right. You can produce all as many empty universes as you want, and there's no penalty for it. <laughs> right. My sense is uh, I, I've seen Smolin's uh, um, uh, idea being promulgated by many people who have all sorts of extrapolated into all sorts of ideas. But I think Lee himself repudiated it a long time ago <laughs> so but it, people, but people, yeah. keep, people keep repeating it like a, you know one of these memes that goes on and on i don't think he can kill it <laughs> yeah it was a cool idea yeah, but I, I don't Absolutely. think it really worked very well and i don't think that yeah even I, really I, I, we love cool ideas that don't work very well but they got to be cool <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what are some of uh, inflation's problems? Put yourself on the other side, Will. Uh, if you're challenging it, what would you say are its uh, its its, its uh, weak points or things that need to be uh, buttoned up? Well, I'm, I spend a lot of time on that in the book. And I mean, one of them is geodesic incompleteness. The fact that you can't get rid of the initial singularity, as one might have hoped, mm. uh, so that you have to have some other physics that gives rise to inflation, and we really don't know what that is. So we have no theory of initial conditions for inflation. One of the things is we talked earlier about observational tests where we can use the cosmic microwave background to actually see the effects of these quantum fluctuations and in inflation. The thing is, we can only see the last little bit, the last few doubling, the last about 80 doublings of inflation. Hmm. Right. But inflation could have gone on for 10,000, a million, a trillion, a quintillion doublings. And all of those things, all of the, the clues to how, how that worked would still be bigger than our observable universe and outside of our reach. And for pretty much forever in principle, we'll never be able to, to see these things. 
And that means that we have no way of determining what the early conditions of inflation were, how it worked, or what set it off in the first place. Mm. And so it's kind of an incomplete theory, and it's one that we'll never be able to test. I mean, there are fundamental physical reasons uh, that, uh, by, by fundamental rules of causality, this stuff is going to stay outside of our horizon essentially forever. Mm. And therefore, this lack of a theory of initial conditions is a, is a big issue, right? We, we really have no way of knowing when inflation started. And in fact, um, inflation needs very special initial conditions to get going at all. They don't have to be as fine-tuned as our universe is now, but there's still some fine-tuning involved. Sure. And this is where what we talked about earlier, people doing these simulations in numerical relativity, that's one of the questions they're trying to understand is how fine-tuned do the initial conditions for inflation have to be in order for it to get started. Once it gets started, it's, it's incredibly efficient. It wipes out everything else. So inflation essentially acts like a big eraser. Whatever the universe was like before inflation <laughs> happens gets wiped out so well by inflation that there's no trace of it left. And so we end up in this peculiar position of having a theory that tells us that the origins of the universe are fundamentally beyond our, beyond our reach scientifically. There's, there's nothing we can do to actually uh, probe those early periods at the beginning of inflation because they've been erased so efficiently by inflationary expansion. Mm. And that's very unsatisfying to a scientist, right? Um, we, we hit the end of the, even the possibility of knowledge. Yeah, I, I liked your definition of the initial singularity. Very simply, it's not a point in space, but a moment in time. Yeah, it's a boundary in time. Hmm. Yeah, um, and uh, another interesting point is that when you when you have this expansion, uh, which during inflation is enormous in terms of the energy of of empty space, we now have that same thing which is going on in terms of uh, uh, the accelerating expansion. Uh, but you explain that that it seems to violate the principle of the conservation of energy, which of course it does. <laughs> right. One of the one of the peculiar things about that you learn when you learn relativity is that uh, uh, conservation of energy doesn't work quite the same way anymore. It's it, energy is still locally conserved, so uh, there, there's still a concept of conservation of energy. But in uh, if the if empty space itself has energy. As the universe expands, you're creating more and more and more empty space. And so you're creating more and more and more energy in that empty space. And that energy isn't coming from anywhere. It's spontaneously arising. And this, and this appears to violate conservation of energy. And in fact, it does. Uh, and that, you just have to learn to live with that. Well, let's compare the horizon of a black hole, which is very much uh, in, the, in the news and in prominence these days, with the horizon of the universe. Each seems to be sort of like a trapped surface with the different paths. Uh, so compare the two. Well, in, the, in a universe with a flat geometry like the one we live in, the size of the observable universe is exactly the same as the radius, the radius of the observable universe is exactly the same as the radius of a black hole of the same total mass. But the universe is not a black hole. And it's it, essentially the horizon of a black hole is what's called a trap surface where every path through space time leads inward. Yes. The horizon of the universe is an anti-trap surface where every path uh, through space time leads outward. And so the, the, the sizes are determined by the same fundamental constants. And in fact, if a black hole of the same total mass as the universe would be exactly the same radius as the universe, but the universe is itself is not actually a black hole. The funny so thing about black holes is that as they get more massive, they get less dense. Right. So a 10 billion solar mass black hole, if you take the volume of the horizon and divide the mass divided by the volume of the horizon, if you define the density that way, the density of a 10 billion solar mass black hole like you have at the center of a galaxy is about one tenth the density of air. <laughs> yeah, that's that's amazing concept, right? Yeah, yeah. I love that. Yeah. Well, uh, so what are the implications of the horizon then, which you say is similar with the black hole trapped and the universe being anti-trapped? Is, is that just a coincidence or is there some fundamental, especially because the 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 radius would be the same? Yeah, well, there's a, there is a fundamental reason for it, which is that it's determined by the same fundamental constants of nature. Newton's constant uh, and the speed of light, basically. Okay. Uh, and since those are the only numbers that you have available, then, the, the, then when the, the horizons end up being the same size because it's the same fundamental constants that determine the horizon size. And then, then how do you get the trapped-anti-trapped difference? 
Well, because the universe, a black hole is a vacuum solution, right? A black hole consists entirely of empty space. The universe yeah. does not consist entirely of empty space. It actually is, an, it, and it extends outside the horizon as well. So that it's just, so they're, they're completely different solutions in general relativity, but the, the radii are the same. Okay, so th that's, that's an important uh, help to our way of understanding because this, some fundamental things are the same and some are just different. Yeah. And we yeah. need to appreciate that. Let's deal with uh, some of the competing theories of evolution very quickly. You mentioned uh, the uh, pyrotic universe, the, the bouncing uh, universe, which doesn't need inflation. Paul Steinhardt, mm -hmm. uh, one, just, just some quick comments on your competition. Yeah, so uh, the, the alternative is that the universe might have been contracting and then re-expanding again. And at least I, I'm not terribly fond of these models for the reason that they tend to have all of the problems that inflation has and more problems as well. Uh, in particular, uh, you, there is no way for, in a, a flat universe like the one we live in for the universe to undergo a bounce as long as general relativity is true. So you have to modify Einstein's theory of relativity in some way in order to get a bounce at all. Inflation doesn't require that. You can just use bog standard relativity and everything works great. In these bouncing models, you actually have to modify relativity in order to get the bounce. Yeah. Um, in addition, there is a problem of instability. So basically what happens in, the, uh, in an expanding universe is that um, when you have little fluctuations, those fluctuations tend to be stable in inflation, right? So you're creating these perturbations, but these perturbations are stable. In, uh, so you have what's called a constant mode where the, they stay constant, and there's a second kind of uh, solution where they call the decaying mode where they, the, the, that decays away. And so you have a stable set of solutions. If you turn time around backwards, that constant mode stays constant, but that decaying mode turns into a growing mode. And what happens is inhomogeneities tend to grow and spoil your solution. So you have to have that bounce before these inhomogeneities get big enough to actually destroy the, uh, the, the nice pro mathematical properties of the universe. And there's really no way around that. Okay, uh, there are other couple of models. Uh, famous one, the Hartle-Hawking no boundary condition universe, explicated recently by Thomas Hertog, who we've uh, talked to, which we enjoyed very much, where in the quantum cosmology uh, model, it, uh, as you go back toward the beginning of the universe, uh, somehow, when you get near the beginning of time, there's some transformation where time becomes another spatial dimension. So you have this roundedness where you have only space and no time, which would under those conditions mean that the universe is finite, self-contained uh, with that roundedness in the beginning of time uh, and that the big, big Bang singularity is avoided. I, as far as I'm aware, that's not incompatible with inflation. So that might be one way that you could uh, try to attack the problem of initial conditions for inflation is by using some of these no boundary ideas as well by doing these Euclidean extensions at the very beginning of inflation and then have an inflationary universe emerge from that. I mean, okay. that, that's within the realm of possibility, yes. Okay, so, and I think that's right. I think uh, inflation is, uh, is, is allowed within that system. So where um, that then becomes what you've defined as the need for uh, 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 the initial singularity or the initial condition. That right. could be one right. model of it. Doesn't have to be the only model. Of it. Yeah, it is certainly one possibility. And presumably, whatever that initial condition is has something to do with quantum gravity. And the no boundary proposals are a nice toy model for how such a quantum initial state might Good. work. Good. Um, Roger Penrose's uh, conformal cyclic cosmology, which in his uh, uh, when he first told us about it, it was uh, the universe forgets how old it is and uh, and, and goes from, you know, huge and and, uh, and and isolated back to the original the original um, uh, hot Big Bang. Yeah, the, the Penrose's model is an interesting one. One problem with it is, is it's pretty vaguely defined, at least as Penrose proposed it. It's very difficult to calculate anything. Um, although our, uh, my most recent paper, uh, written in collaboration with uh, a couple of really excellent scientists at uh, Indian Institute of Technology in Madras, we actually argue that uh, Penrose's conformal cyclic cosmology, at least one that is compatible with a, a realistic universe, is also going to be geodesically incomplete, much less like inflation, that you're going to inevitably find singularities in, in, even in that ex these extensions that were proposed by Penrose. Uh, we have a paper out that's currently under peer review that's making that argument. Okay. Um, let's get back, uh, and we want to 
finish up, we could love to talk for the next five hours, but finish up back to the initial singularity. And I want to read what you wrote near the end of your book uh, in terms of some big picture. And you say, we may well speculate that the origin of inflation itself lies in quantum uncertainty acting on some primordial, inherently quantum gravitational state, which we've been discussing, in which neither space nor time nor causality have meaning a universe ex nihilo, which is a term used in theology, but you used it, and uncaused. Uh, this, you say, this is the explanation I favor. Why do you favor that? Well, because it sort of deals with the Aristotle's problem of the first mover, right? So that we know that as, the, uh, 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 as you get closer to a singularity, that uh, our, law, our understanding of physics breaks down. And the hope, at least among most of us, is that uh, a unification of quantum mechanics and gravity will provide an explanation for the physics, will remove those singularities and explain what actually happens near these singular points. For example, the centers of that black holes or at the beginning of the universe. And that quantum gravitational state was probably, whatever it is, is probably fundamentally very, very different from any sort of normal space time. That we, space and time themselves would become quantum mechanical. And Presumably, whatever explains the or, or emergence of inflation is going to be found in such a theory of quantum gravity. And I'm just saying that that's where I think we ought to be looking. But even our ideas of causality, probably, normal causality, probably aren't going to apply in such a circumstance. So we're going to have to come up with a new way of looking at it. But your axiomatic assumption is that the laws of quantum physics or quantum gravity, even in that primordial sense, are somehow foundational or eternal and, and and, and perhaps necessary in some sense is isn't that a fundamental assumption? Yeah, yeah, I guess I guess you could say that. And we really don't know. I mean, there, there, there's 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 a deep well of mystery there, and uh, it's going to be interesting to see how far we can plummet. And you conclude uh, directly on that mystery with one of my favorite lines in all of human writings: the first line of the Tao Te Ching. Uh, the Tao that can be told is not the eternal Tao. The name that can be named is not the eternal name. And there are various inter interpretations because everything I just said, the Chinese is very brief and very poetic. It goes like this. Tao ke Tao, Fei Chang Tao. Ming ke Ming, Fei Chang Ming. And what that means is exactly what you said, but it says it in such a compact way that you can have various interpretations. So, why did you end the book with that? I, I thought it was great. Yeah, I, this is that quote is that, that translation is from my favorite translation of the Tao. I, 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 I don't speak Chinese, so I've never read the original. But um, that I mean, that gets to the essential mystery of beginnings in and of themselves. Right. And it, it ultimately, when you talk about the idea of the universe having a beginning, Inevitably, you run into a place where you, you know, there, you know, it's it's an eternal thing that has no name, and you're ultimately going to come across mystery at the end of the day. And I and I don't think that science is capable of resolving that mystery completely. Uh, and I, I think you know we may in fact have to live with that. There are limits to our knowledge. There are limits to what we can find out about the universe. And I don't think that we're ever going to strip that origin of the universe from its ultimate mystery. I, I, I just don't think that science is capable of doing that. And it, it's that if you can if you can discern it in science, it's not the ultimate truth. I mean, that's another way yeah. to put it. And that, it's sort of self-limiting in that way, yes. And I think that quote very much gets to that idea. That's, that's great. Uh, well, I, I thoroughly enjoyed this. I said we could talk for several hours, but um, um, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And we look forward to continuing to hear about your work. Um, Viewers can watch dozens of TV episodes, Closer to the Truth TV episodes, and hundreds, literally hundreds, of exclusive videos on cosmology, including many with Alan Guth and Andre Lindy and many of the people that are mentioned in Will's book on the Closer to the Truth website and the Closer to the Truth YouTube channel. Thank you for watching. Thanks again, Will. Thank you very much, Robert. I really enjoyed it. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please like and comment below. You can support Closer to Truth by subscribing.